Yeah, you thought you guys were going to get up without hearing from me, well, didn't you? <laughs> no, I'm just coming up. I just want to express my gratitude and, my, and the joy that I've had for the last several weeks as uh, waiting for what's going to be happening this morning as uh, Ryan's going to be coming and he's, uh, he's going to be God's spokesman uh, for us this morning. He's going to speak God's word to us yeah. and I just want to, I, I am just so excited about him. Uh, you know, Vi and I, uh, as we met him back in August, have really grown to, to love him, uh, to appreciate him. Uh, we love so much his heart for God. And uh, so I don't take any more time of his in God's time. I am going to give him this little charge if I may though. Uh, this is the charge that uh, God gave to Joshua as, uh, as, the, as that transition of leadership power, if you will, went from Moses to Moses, who had passed away and was moving on to, uh, on to Joshua. Here's what, here's what God said to him. He says, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I have sworn to their forefathers to give them. Be very strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Is the mic on? Am I good? All right. So, before we do anything, uh, we have to pray. Pray. Alright, so would you guys bow your heads and uh, close your eyes and pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are. I pray that you would just, this morning, I pray that you would, that you would empty me of me and fill me with your spirit, God. And I pray that you would prepare all of our hearts this morning to hear what you have to say as we dive into your word. God, we love you so much. We're ready to hear from you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was at a church planting conference in Orlando. And it's, it's a conference called Exponential. It's one of the biggest church planting conferences in the country. And uh, for some reason, God really wanted me there. So uh, he actually sent me and Noah there for free. Like, our housing, our food for the week, and our tickets, and it was completely paid for. I don't know how that happens, except for God. <laughs> That's it. And uh, it was incredible. It was an incredible conference. And one of the things that they talked about, I, the one thing that really stuck with me, was one of the speakers was talking, and he said, we are not called to be heroes. But instead, we are called to be hero makers. Amen. And one of the ways we do that is by building up a platform and letting somebody else stand on it. And so when you look at me this morning and you see this kid talking to you, I don't want you to just see some kid. I want you to see discipleship exemplified. Pastor John, Gary, the elders, they, they spend their time creating this platform Building this church, and I'm not talking about the walls, I mean us, the church. And today they were willing to step down and let somebody else take this platform so that they could teach me, they could teach Noah, they could teach us how to make disciples and go out and do the work God has called us to. Amen. So I want to thank you guys for giving me this opportunity. I seriously appreciate it. Yeah, And in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go out and make disciples of all the nations. That's what he's called us to. And when we live that life, when we're building up that platform, letting somebody else stand on it, when we are making disciples, you know what happens? We tick Satan off. We get right under his skin. 
He doesn't want you following Jesus. He doesn't want you making disciples. He doesn't want you going out and furthering the kingdom. He wants to take you down. And this morning, I really feel like God has put on my heart to mention the fact that we are in a spiritual war. Growing up, my mom had me take piano lessons. So in second grade, I started taking piano lessons. And then in third grade, I started taking guitar lessons. And every year, I kept switching back and forth between piano and guitar, and then somewhere in the middle, I started singing. And uh, so from second grade all the way up to, to my ninth grade year, I, I just kept taking those music lessons. And I had the same music teacher for all of it. And that man, my music teacher, he became a father figure in my life. So I would come to him with, with all of my problems, <laughs> and I would come to him, and when, when I came to him with, with something I was struggling with, I would say, hey, Dave, I'm really struggling with this today. I just, I don't know what's going on. And it was my favorite thing ever. He would look at me, he would sit me down, he would look at me right in the eye, and he said, Ryan, you are in a war. And if you are flying over the enemy and he is not trying to shoot you down, you are doing something wrong. And I love it. He said it multiple times. It still sticks with me today. And we have to keep in mind, if we are following Christ, if we are striving to look more like Jesus every single day, and Satan's not trying to shoot us down, we're doing something wrong. But even with that being said, we have to keep in mind, when Satan attacks, yeah, trials are going to come. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, right? And so as believers, it's important that we know when Satan attacks and how we can fight back. So if you have your Bibles, flip to Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. All right, I'm going to read it real quick. It says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, now this is an, incre an extremely pivotal moment in Jesus' life. A couple things are going on here. First, Jesus receives the Spirit of God. And this is crucial because Jesus is about to walk into the beginning of his ministry. So God looks at Jesus and says, I want you to have my Spirit inside of you before you go into ministry. So Jesus receives the Spirit, but then God says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And now we can look at that verse and say, oh, God was just complimenting Jesus. Like, oh, that's my son. Yes, that's what he was saying. But God was marking. There, there were people around during Jesus' baptism. And God was looking at Jesus and he was saying, this is my son. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior of the world. And now I want you to imagine Satan he's sitting in hell, and he's watching this going on. And all of a sudden, he sees Jesus get baptized. He sees the light shine down on Jesus, and he says, whoa, what's going on? And then he hears God say, this is my beloved son. This is the Messiah. And then Satan gets up, and he goes, wait a second. He puts on his armor, he gets his sword, he gets his shield, and he says, that's who I'm going to attack. As soon as God marked Jesus as the Messiah, Satan knew who to attack. And we have to see that in verses 16 and 17, Jesus receives the Spirit, God marks him as the Messiah, and literally the verse after Satan comes. And this is, we're going to be reading in Matthew 4, and this is, this is where Jesus gets tempted by Satan. So I want you to see Matthew 4, verse 1. This is then... 
Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Which that first word, then. Jesus has this incredible spiritual high moment. And then Satan comes. Satan is going to attack after a spiritual high moment in our lives. You ever have that moment where you're like, man, I am just so full of the Spirit right now. Like, nothing can stop me. I, I, I have Jesus. Jesus is inside of me. I, I, I can conquer the world right now. I can, go heal, I can go heal a blind man right now if I want to. But then, when you're feeling that, all of a sudden something goes wrong. Maybe you have an incredible devotional time with Jesus in the morning. And then right after you get that phone call, you just do not want to hear that. Maybe you go out to lunch with your friend and you get to tell them about Jesus for the first time. And as soon as you walk out of lunch, you, you go into your car and you see, oh, I got a flat tire. <laughs> or maybe it's right after you walk out of church. You just had an incredible worship experience, and then your husband or your wife is getting on you, and you're getting angry because you're both hungry, you need some lunch. <laughs> when we have a spiritual high moment, we have to be on guard. We have to be prepared for Satan to attack when we feel so connected to Jesus. Satan doesn't want that. He doesn't want us to have that intimacy with our Creator. He's going to try to disrupt that. And now, yes, Jesus just had an incredible spiritual high moment. But Satan attacked immediately after his spiritual high. And he also attacked right before Jesus was about to walk into his ministry. I want you to see Matthew 4, verse 17. <clears throat> From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Satan is going to attack right before walking in to the place God wants to. Maybe it's a new ministry opportunity. Maybe God's calling you to, to talk to that person for the first time about Jesus. Maybe it's your own, your own kid, grandkid, sibling. And all of a sudden, Satan attacks. He's going to try to throw you off. Just an example. This is only my second time preaching. But my first time preaching, I, I preached out at a church in Lakeland, and that's about an hour away. And uh, so that Sunday morning came, we had to drive about an hour out to Lakeland in that entire hour-long car ride. I just, I, I heard Satan whispering in my head that entire time. I says, what do you think you're doing? You were only 20 years old. What makes you think you can preach the word of God? You are not good enough. You are not smart enough. What makes you think you're wise enough? And I heard Satan say, I think you misheard the voice of God for the voice of Satan. And I was so thrown off that entire morning. And if I'm being real with you guys, I didn't preach the way I wanted to. I wasn't ready for that kind of attack. That was new to me. That's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to throw you off your game. But look at Matthew, let's look at Matthew 4, verses 2 and 3. And after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Okay. Jesus fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. He hasn't eaten in a long time. 
I don't know about you guys, but if I even skip lunch, I get angry. <laughs> so hungry, I get angry. I get irritable. I feel drained. I feel like I don't have that energy to keep going throughout my day. It gets tough. And that's, Jesus was most definitely feeling that. For sure. And when we look at those verses, we have to see that Satan is going to come when we are physically and emotionally weak. Satan wants to throw you off. Satan wants to throw you off your A game. But if you're already off your game, you're open to attack. You guys ever watch a boxing match? And the fighters, they, they'll keep going, and the longer the fight goes, the more tired the fighter gets. Right? And what happens when the fighter gets tired? His hand starts to go down. His guard starts to come down. When we become physically and emotionally weak, our guard comes down. We have to be ready. When we feel, man, I'm just not... On my A game today, so we gotta lean in to God's strength, not our own. Put our hands back up. We're still in a war. Now look at Matthew 4, verse 5 and 6. It says, Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. <laughs> Satan just tempted Jesus with scripture. That kind of scares me. That means Satan knows the Bible. Satan knows God's word. And one of the ways that he's going to attack us is by distorting the scriptures. He's gonna, he wants us to take verses out of context so that we think God wants something different for us. I mean, just look at Genesis 3. We're in the garden. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. Hmm. I'll be honest, I can't help but look at that and say, when, when Satan said to them, you surely will not die, Satan was, I can't help but look at that and say, yeah, physically, they weren't going to be harmed. When they, when they ate from that tree, yeah, physically they were fine. But God wasn't talking about physically. As soon as they ate from that tree, spiritually they were dead. We are not a body with a spirit, we're a spirit with a body. And as soon as they ate from that tree, spiritually they died. And they were banished from the garden, and they no longer had that. Connect connectivity with God the way God intended it to be. Satan made disobedience look appealing. And when Satan distorts the scriptures, he's going to do it in a way that justifies our sins. Mm -hmm. Alright, but hold up a second, Ryan. Yeah, we're starting to see how Satan attacks. But how do we fight back? 
How do we prepare ourselves for when Satan attacks? Flip to Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 13. Verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and have done, having done everything to stand firm. When Satan comes, we can't do it on our own. But God says, you don't have to. In fact, he doesn't want you to. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We've got to lean into God. I just took a, a course on Nehemiah and, uh, and it emphasized the power of prayer. And I think the coolest thing it said was, what prayer does is it taps into the power of God. It taps into the resources God has. And God has unlimited, unlimited resources. We have to pray to God. We have to tap into His strength, not our own. He doesn't expect you to walk through these trials I want you to see something else in, in Matthew 4. Look at how Jesus fought back Satan every time. In verse 4 it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Every single time Jesus fights back Satan with Scripture. That's why it's so important. It's so important that we memorize Scripture. And we have it ready on the tip of our tongues at all times. I'm jumping around a little bit. But in Ephesians 6 again, in verse 17... It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Alright, now, the coolest thing GCBI has taught me so far is when I think of the sword of the Spirit, I think of this huge sword, right? I think I'm going to take this, this shield, I'm going to take this sword, and I'm going to go slay a dragon. Like, I'm ready. But... When they, when they say the sword of the spirit, they're not talking about this giant sword. In fact, Roman soldiers, they had an emergency dagger strapped to their thigh. And it's quick, right? So that way, when other soldiers came and they felt cornered, they had this dagger they could quickly take out and defend themselves with. It's supposed to be quick. So when we memorize scripture, it has to be on the tip of our tongues. We have to know it. We've got to be ready. Because these trials are going to come. So that emergency dagger is ready. It's going to be quick. And then, one more thing I wanted to point out was When Jesus was being tempted, physically, he was alone. Obviously, God was there in the midst of it all. But physically, he didn't have a disciple next to him. He didn't have Peter and John next to him. 
physically he was alone. The temptation and our trials, they're going to come when, when we are isolated and alone. That's when Satan can start to creep into your head. And because of that, it's incredibly important that when trials come, we surround ourselves with biblical community. That's why the church is so important. In Ephesians 6, verse 16, it says, In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Alright, this is another cool part. GCBI taught me. I think of the sword of spirit. It's a huge sword. It's not. It's a dagger. I thought the shield was like a circular shield. Do any of you guys like superheroes? I'm a huge superhero guy. Yeah. And uh, Captain America, he's got this circular shield, right? That's not what they're talking about when they say the, the shield of faith. In fact, do you ever see a, a picture of a SWAT team member trying to suppress a riot? He's got this riot shield. It's this big shield. And the soldiers, they, they had the, these big shields. It would go from your feet about up to eye level. And it was this big, wonky kind of shield, right? It's not quick like a little circular shield. So by itself, the shield's ineffective. But the shield was meant to be on the front lines of battle. And you're supposed to link arms with your other soldiers. And when you linked arms with your other soldiers, it created a wall. So that when the arrows came, it just bounced right off. The arrows couldn't touch you because when you linked arms, the wall was ready. You had your def you had your defenses up. You were good. So we have to see that the shield of faith by itself is ineffective. But when we link arms, when we become the body of Christ, when we come together like the church family we are. That's when Satan's arrows can't touch us. When you feel that the trial's coming, when you get that bad phone call, something's going on in your family. Think arms. We are not designed to do this alone. And yes, I mentioned that Jesus was physically alone. But if you look at Matthew 4, verse 11, Satan, or Jesus just overcame all of Satan's temptations. And then in verse 11 it says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. God is there in the midst of your trial your temptation. As soon as Satan left him, God, God was there in the midst, so as soon as Satan left him, God came in and says, he began to minister to him. They probably, those angels probably got Jesus a huge cheeseburger because he had, hadn't eaten for so long. <laughs> God is there in the midst of your trials and temptation. You are not alone. 2 Peter, verses 2 and 3, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to a life of godliness. Through the true knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and excellence, you feel like Satan's getting in your head. You hear him whispering, ah, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know the Bible. Like others do. I don't know how to fight back. God's already given you everything you need to live a life of God. 
I can't help but look at the church family here. It's like, man, just link arms. He's giving you everything. He's giving you, he's giving you a spirit. He's giving you his word. This is God's breath on pages. He's giving you church. And if that's not enough, Matthew 4.11 shows us that God is there in the midst of it all. God himself. <laughs> so when the trials come, life starts getting tricky. Keep leaning into him. Stand firm in his strength. We don't have to do this on our own. In fact, we shouldn't. Recognize when Satan is going to attack. And know when to link arms. Know when to be on guard. It's so important. Would you guys pray with me? God, thank you for who you are. Yes, trials are going to come, but God, you've given us everything we need to live a life of godliness. Thank you for giving us your spirit. Thank you for living inside of us. Thank you for being alive. Thank you for giving us your word. And God, I thank you for every single person here today. Because we are the church. Thank you for giving us the ability to link arms and be on guard together. God, just thank you for being so big, being so powerful but still choosing to be in the midst of our trials for every single one. God, we love you so much. I pray that you would just allow this to really hit home with us today. Take it home with us and help us to always recognize when we need to be on guard. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Amen.